Your loving is healing. So you just made me think of that when you were t describing like a dentist. Because sometimes we have a cavity, we don't feel the cavity. But we feel it when they try to fix it, you know. So, interesting. Yeah, yeah it's very much like that. It's kind of like, too, <clears throat> taking, taking a child to the hospital for the first time. And as you're pulling up, you know, already the child may have anxiety and uneasy feeling like, Mommy, Daddy, I don't want to go into that place. And then when you finally <clears throat> park the car and you get through the gates and they start to see this kind of sterile environment with all these people walking around with very serious faces and some people, if, they, if you take them in near the emergency room, you maybe see some blood and grieving and crying and everything. Mommy, I don't want to go to this place. This is a bad place. This isn't like my playground at all. <laughs> Like my Play-Doh factory, this is not at all. And then, but, but the parent would say, well, you know, it's again a comforting thing. Like these are agents of healing. You know, these are, these are people that have dedicated their whole life. Even though we would say metaphysically they, they still are trying to work on fixing symptoms and, you know, tinkering with the effects. Uh, still, the underlying passion and and purpose for getting into the helping professions to be a doctor or a nurse is for healing, which is a beautiful thing. Anyone who devotes their life to healing, it's a beautiful thing. And they, they may be, as all human beings, a little misguided about what true he healing is, because healing really is not of the body. But there's nothing wrong with um, magically, temporarily easing pains and discomforts. Uh, that, that has its helpfulness. I think Jesus was even, he dictated the Course, he dictated the Song of Prayer, he dictated the Psychotherapy Pamphlet, and he was even working on uh, dictating and helping to illustrate a, a healing machine. It never was completed, um, but, it, but there was actually early blueprints coming from Jesus for a healing machine. See, he's, n he's not against removing pain and suffering, even with magical means. He just knows that there is a solution that will bring eternal relief, you know, and that's really what he was here to teach and to demonstrate for all of us. There's no problem with magic. We were having this discussion about Christian science the other day and, and uh, a lot of times people have a lot of anger at different cases over the last century of, of Christian science families, you know, not taking their children in for uh, medical attention and so on and so forth. And a lot of anger had projected onto Christian science. And basically, I said, no, I can channel uh, Mary Baker Eddy for you if you want to know the, the core meaning of Christian science. Pray first. Pray first. Turn to God first. That's all she was teaching in you know, all those years. And the ego, of course, can twist things and project things onto her and onto her beautiful teachings, but that's all she was teaching. Pray first. Use the power of the mind. Go to the power of the mind. Jesus comes along with his course and he makes it very clear that there's nothing wrong with magic. Surgery, Reiki, I mean, whatever you want to put in that category of, of alternative healing or what, what's more traditional healing. There's nothing wrong with medicine, there's nothing wrong with any of that. And even for somebody like Gandhi used like herbs, herbal cures. He had all kinds of herbal cures. He wasn't so much into medicine the way the world would describe it, but he, in his own way, herbal cures. But that, that's still magic. And there's nothing wrong with magic, but it's like when you do the mind training and you open to the miracle and you allow your mind to become consistently miracle-minded, then you're approaching, you know, that, that statement where he said to the woman at the well, drink of me and you will never thirst again. The cure is eternal. The cure is not temporary. Magic is temporary relief from pain and suffering. Atonement is eternal 
relief. Drink of me and you will never thirst again. How beautiful. You know, I used to weep tears of joy when I would, you know, read the Bible, read some of those passages. How beautiful to, to have that healing balm of offering eternity, offering the presence of eternity, you know, come unto me, you who are weary. You know, I shall give you rest, you know, the rest of the mind, the peace and stillness of the mind. That is the, the cure with a capital C. That is the eternal state that we were created in. Of course that would be the answer to all problems. It would be a state of mind. And all we're doing is we're opening to that every day. Now, what it takes to to truly heal, some of you are familiar with the prayer on, so if you had the first edition of the book, it was on page 24, and then the later editions, it's on page 28. I am here only to be truly helpful. I am here to represent Him who sent me. I do not have to worry about what to say or what to do, for He who sent me will direct me. I am content to be wherever He wishes, knowing He goes there with me, and I will be healed as I let him teach me to heal. Well, in order to heal, we're, t we're not talking about healing the body, because at one point Jesus says, don't ask the Holy Spirit to heal the body. Ask the Holy Spirit to heal your perception of the body. Because we've discussed earlier, it's fragmented perception that's the problem. A broken body, a sick body, is not the problem. Healing the body and rescuing the dolphins Aren't those stepping stones to meet a person where they are in perception? It's, it's the goal is ultimately to correct perception. But where they are in the dream, this is a service that, it, that they're extending. They're valid, I, in my opinion, they're valid services to get the person to where they need to be. To get to the point where they understand, maybe somebody's trying to say the dolphins is communicating the message, this is life. And we've got to work, work from, as you said yesterday, from the bottom up, right? Yeah, I think that that's, that's the graciousness of the Holy Spirit, that the Holy Spirit will, will reach the mind exactly where and when and what it believes. You know, it, it reaches it in that way. So those, those are symbols. I mean, Jesus would say things like, even when the blind could see and the lame could walk and so forth, he would say something in the Bible like, tell no man. Because he, d he didn't really want the word to spread of being a physical healer. There was a plenty of that going on. But he had a much higher message. He had a message of atonement. Our kingdom is not of this world. I'm calling you out of the world. I'm calling you to wake up from the dream of this world. And, and what we would call symptom removal or uh, things like, like wildlife sanctuaries and so on and so forth, those are stepping stones along the way. It's not so much that that a teacher of God, you know, should do that. In, in fact, when, when Jesus talks about true empathy versus false empathy, he's basically saying that salvation and healing depend on you staying with what's real and true. And uh, at times people have said to me, you know, David, you really, you have to reach people where they're at. And I will say, uh-huh, and where exactly are they at? And what I say to them is, when you go inside and you have that experience of the Christ presence, and you really know everyone as the Christ, you know, like, I, this is a different teaching than the old uh, guru, you know, I'm awake and you're not. This That atonement really shows you that the whole world is awake with you. And that is the state of true empathy. So when people say you've got to reach people where they're at, of course the Holy Spirit, uh, if someone followed me around with a camera and they see me going into nursing homes and third world countries and, and you know, going to visit this, uh, when I was in Colombia they took me to, uh, to a little school in which all of the children, the children range from maybe like three or four years old up to maybe 12 or 13 years old, all of them had been diagnosed as HIV positive. All of them had been abandoned by their parents. 
just left out somewhere and had been scooped up and all of them were in the same school. So I was there with maybe 40, 45 children uh, that were all diagnosed with HIV positive. And uh, the director of the school had, had heard me talk and had said, come, please come to the school. And so I gathered a group of about 10 people and I said, we're going to take a beautiful mission today. We're going to this HIV positive school to shine the light, to let the love pour through us uh, for these children. And uh, it was kind of funny when I get there to my friend Lily's house to go uh, to this school. I, I've got the people with me and one of the women brought along her suicidal teenage daughter. Uh, and she just came to me before we left and she just looked at me with her eyes and tears in her eyes. She said, can you meet with her? Can you say something? Can you do something? Because uh, this teenage girl's wrist and arm was just slid up all over the place. She had tried to take her life on numerous times. She's maybe 13, 14 years old. She has her whole arm just sliced up and everything. And I, I didn't feel guided to meet with her at that point, but I just told the mother, bring her along. Bring her to this school with, with all the HIV babies. So we went over there, and on the way there, they were just asking me, they're very open just to guidance, and so they said, what should we do? And I said, let's pull in, let's go to the grocery store, we're going to buy a uh, fruit drink, we're going to buy toys, uh, we're going to we'll go through there and pick things out. We went through and we picked out Pocahontas <laughs> in Spanish. <laughs> I said, we're going to show them a movie, we're going to go in there and we're going to just be the presence of love and joy. And when we got over there, we just, they actually had HIV babies that they had just pulled in that were abandoned. We cuddled with the HIV babies and it turned out that that young woman, who, the teenager who had tried to commit suicide so many times, she just, her heart totally opened up by cuddling these and holding these little HIV babies. So much so that she told the director, I want to come and volunteer here. She literally found her purpose on this visit. That was the answer that the Holy Spirit gave to, can you help my, my daughter? She's always trying to kill herself. She needed a purpose. She needed a reason to live. She needed a way to, in a palpable way, to functionally extend love and feel that love activated in her heart. So we, we watched movie, we watched Pocahontas, we had snacks, we spent the whole day with them. And I do remember one little boy, I don't speak Spanish, but I remember um, he, he sat on my lap and I cuddled him during the whole movie and he kept, with his eyes, he kept turning around and looking at me over and over and over. And I asked, he kept saying something in Spanish. And uh, so I finally I asked the interpreter, or interpreter, what is he saying? And he kept saying, you are my daddy. You are my daddy. Over and over and over. And to watch their little faces light up. So, you know, that's, that's what it's about. Just like my recent v visit to China, I watched the people cry, weep, uh, pour out their hurts and their, their pains in their life that they had never given themselves permission to do that. I watched the tears rolling down their faces and so forth. It's it's truly the presence of love, and that presence of love is the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit knows always what we should say and do. Behavior should never be under conscious control. You know, even St. Augustine, you know, who, who lived centuries ago over in Europe, he had a saying, love and do what you will. <laughs> love and do what you will. When you connect in the miracle, when you really connect with the Holy Spirit and the power of the Holy Spirit, whatever you say and do is going to be the most perfect thing for the whole universe. I've had times, one time I was in Argentina and, and my friend Maria Cristina you are, uh, which I, I always call her, Mary Christ you are, Mary Christ you are. <laughs> she had translated for Wayne Dyer and she translated for me in Buenos Aires and all around there. One time we were 
we were sitting, we were going to a gathering, and we were in her car, and we came to the railroad tracks, and the, the gate came down, and um, there was no train. The gate just came down, and we sat there for like 25 minutes, <laughs> and she just is looking for the gate, and we're supposed to be going to a Course in Miracles gathering, and she's like, okay, David, you know, people love to ask you metaphysical questions. This is what, what is going on? We're, we're going to be late for the, the gathering. This train thing just came down right before we got to it. And she said, I do not understand what the purpose is of this happening. Please explain this to me. And I said, just wait. Just wait. So we waited another four or five minutes. A homeless woman very emaciated and very skinny, with a with baby in her arms, came to the window, <laughs> the driver's side, Maria's side, and and I said, roll down the window. <laughs> she rolled down the window, and Maria always loved to give coins. We we give coins to children. You know, there's a lot of starving children back then in 2003, 2004 collapsed economy and everything like this, we would go around a city of like 15, 16 million people and have all these encounters. I'd say, here's the reason <laughs> why we're right here right now is this. And that mother came up there, we rolled down the window and she gave some coins and she always carried these little tiny little angels and the children would always light up because they're very spiritual, you know, and then they see this little angel, I got an angel! You know, it's one thing to get some coins, but an angel, ha! Ah, <laughs> mix in with your coins. It's the Spanish, you know, they're very much into those symbols. So we simply, we gave her money for, for food, and it was a holy encounter. But again, it was just the Spirit orchestrates everything, not for the reason that we think things are happening, but just to offer the presence of love. Everyone we meet, everywhere we go, has only one purpose, and that's to let the presence of love pour through us, regardless of the circumstances, regardless of the situations. I had students back in the 1990s and they would like to travel around with me. Sometimes we would go downtown, to like downtown Cincinnati, and they would love to watch me with the homeless people on the streets just to learn from watching the interactions. Because I wasn't giving money to every homeless person. Some of them I would just meet with them and talk with them or hug them. And some of them had not been hugged in the longest time. They weren't used to having somebody stare them in the eyes. And so we had all kinds of encounters. And then occasionally uh, I would be prompted by the Holy Spirit to give some money. Um, one time I was down in Colombia and I was in, on the streets of Cali, Colombia. And there was uh, a lot of people that had been traveling around with me. We had healings and we were working with different people. And we were sitting right at a little pizza parlor, one of these little um, group of tables that was right out in the street. And we had just finished like a, like a whole day of gatherings. We'd come out there to have some pizza and we're sitting there. And I, they'd given me some pesos as donations for the gathering. So I had a wad of pesos in my right pocket. So we're sitting out there having pizza. And these homeless people, one after the other, would come up to our table as we're having pizza. And they were telepathically drawn to me. They were out there, maybe called homeless in the world's eyes, but they're miracle workers. They're out there. They know they were shining the light. And one after the other, we must have had five different homeless people come to us while we're at, at the pizza place eating and come to me and just stare into my eyes with their eyes real big and all this love pouring out of them and all the love pouring out of me. And then they would just look at me and I would go, are you hungry? And they'd say, oh yes. And I'd pull out some of the wad of pesos and give it to them and then the next one would come. Sometimes they, were, they had little things that they made, cute little sayings in Spanish that were all about love and forgiveness that they would, that's how they would get their daily bread by these cute little things, like little jewelry things that they would make. I'd say, oh, oh, I'd show it to me, show it to me. And they'd show me all their little forgiveness trinkets and everything. I'd say, now go, show it to everybody at the table. And then if everybody at the table, they were fine to look at it or read it, he'd say, take it, take it. It was very generous, please take it. And if they didn't give him any money, then he'd come back to me and I'd go, 
and I'd pull out of the wad. <laughs> well, I did this for like five people. And Kirsten was with me at the time, and she's going, are you just going to feed everybody on the street here? I said, this is Holy Spirit's money. We just got this at the gathering. It's up to the Holy Spirit to direct where it goes. And I said, these are my workers. They've been in the field all day. They're just coming in to get some, have a little bit to eat. They're out there all day. You know, I mean, I mean, that's the feel. You get into this joy of the love, and it's like a telepathic connection, and, and everything, the words come through you, just flow through you. The smiles, the hugs, come on over here, even if you've never met them. And the Spirit knows what everybody needs. No human being could possibly know that, but the Spirit does really know that. Yeah, we, we're, we're not really coming from a motive of trying to seek to change the world or to heal the world, but, but the more you really work on this, the more you see that, that the healing of your mind you know, is a huge undertaking. You know, it's going to require lots of mind training, it's going to require lots of patience, lots of determination, lots of persistence, in the face of all kinds of temptations, you know, to get off onto something else or try to pick another uh, motive or another uh, function. But all I keep saying to people is that it's so well worth it. You know, I mean, a peaceful, tranquil mind is not a small gift. And, you know, that's what we're going for. We're going for something so high, peace of mind. And meanwhile, you know, it comes through us in ways that, that seems to offer comfort to the world in the way that, that people can seem to receive it. Uh, one time I was in St. Louis and Kirsten and I just got out of this gathering with our friend Mary and we were walking along and we were walking along the ro street of downtown St. Louis and this man came hobbling and limping up to us and um, kind of came right up to us and in our face and was really pleading with us, can you help me, can you help me, I've, I, I have to get my medicine and I don't have the money and he was very tense and very stressed and he was hobbling and, and so forth and everything. And we had just come out of this probably seven hour Course in Miracles day long workshop. We're just brimming with joy. Just brimming with joy. Just the joy is just radiating from us. And he comes up to us and so I just kept, he was looking into my eyes and kept talking to talking, talking and everything. And it turned into like this 15 minute holy encounter where he kept trying to explain how terrible his life was. Uh, you know, he'd say, you don't, you just don't understand how miserable my life is. He said, I'm in great panic and everything here. I'm sure if they'd have filmed it, it would have been interesting, but his extreme strain and stress and our glowing faces, we just came out of like seven hours of it, we could hardly even, you know, we were drunk on the Lord. <laughs> we were like completely drunk on the Lord. And he kept, he would like talk about all these problems and he would kind of look us in the eye like, do you hear me? <laughs> are you people, are you people drunk or, you know, really, I mean, he really, are you? And, and it just continued on for like 15 minutes and until crack, 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 his face started to smile, his forehead started to soften and went serene. I mean, the joy was just so tangible, palpable. We were in such a state of joy, it just swallowed him up. And and he just started smiling and laughing and everything. And occasionally he'd say, "You know, I I still need that medicine." <laughs> he'd like it was like, "I'm God, I'm happy now. I don't know what happened, but I still, I still it's slipping something about the medicine or something." And finally, at the very end, I said, "I said, how much do you need?" And he said, "I I said it's twenty dollars." I said, "Oh, that's no problem." I slipped him a twenty dollar bill, and off he went, no limp. <laughs> I mean, he literally, he literally walked off cruising. He was smooth as could be, but his his state of mind had had just changed like 360 degrees, because he was just caught up in our joy. You know, they talk about it being contagious. It's really everything. The whole world is a is a projection of our mind, and the whole world reflects our state of mind. And you know, like that song, when you're smiling. When you're smiling, the whole world smiles with you. Dun, dun, dun. You know, that's the way that it goes. But you have to really 
really be vigilant with the mind training, you know. You just, you really come strong into that mind training and you practice it and practice it and practice it. And you, you it's one sense you just kind of let the Holy Spirit kind of lift you up, kind of t towards that celestial realm, you know. Miracles are above the the daily realm, they kind of lift you into the celestial realm of, of joy and happiness, which is our natural state. And then it just seems to radiate with everyone that you meet. And you've all had that experience. You know, when some days you wake up and you're in that happy, happy state of mind and you go on this errand, that errand, you go here and there, you get a phone call, oh, I haven't heard from you for the longest time. You know, it's just, it just, it does feel contagious. It does, it just extends and spreads. And so all we're really here to do is to inspire ourselves and each other, you know, in this new direction, you know, to really, to live in a very high state of mind. And it's, it's such an honor, really, when you think of it. You couldn't have a more honorable vocation <laughs> than, than a miracle worker. Even though oftentimes people go, Did you, you're picking me? Me? You sure? You know, you, know, you don't even have to have this, the resume. You know, it's like all you have to do is have the willingness. You don't have to like a, get an earthly job, you got to have usually the resume, the CV down here. But, uh, but with heaven, with the Holy Spirit, it's like, okay, I'm willing. And then when you're willing, then be ready. Because <laughs> Christ is already ready. It's not like Christ has to go, okay, now I'll find something for you to do here. Uh, <laughs> Just hold on there a little bit with your willingness. No, it's like when you're willing, I'm ready. I've been ready <laughs> all along, you know. So, yeah, it works.